Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So as Arpit said, uh, we're going to take it up a level a little bit. You may be thinking, what is a KPMG guy, an audit, tax, professional services firm doing at an open networking summit? Um, so my background, uh, I recently uh, uh, led uh, Dell's networking, conversion infrastructure, solutions business uh, uh, when Dell had acquired Force 10 uh, from a networking standpoint and we created spine and leaf architectures and Kevin Schatzkamer and, and some of my ex-colleagues at Dell, they'll be up here for the Intel talking about that. Before that, I was with Huawei 3Com, uh, which was H3C and the Huawei is going to be coming up uh, after me. Uh, and then before that was around, uh, if I'm going to dating myself, was Cabletron Systems and a and, and bunch of uh, FIDI Sonnet uh, you know, uh, work that we've been doing, hence, hence the gray beard. Um, so we, we thought we will you know, take it up a level and help you connect the dots of if we're talking about an open networking ecosystem, how does that open networking ecosystem connect to the C-suite, meaning that if the world is moving to cloud, and that doesn't mean just public clouds or you know, telcos you know, uh, providing MPLS in the cloud, but applications that are moving into the cloud, so if you look at Salesforce, or you look at Workday or ServiceNow, what's the role of the network, and how do you make the network relevant to the C-suite? So that's what I'm going to cover in the next 19 minutes with you. Uh, just a quick uh, one, one pager on what KPMG is. So KPMG, um, you know, in about 150 plus countries, 200,000 people, and all professionals who provide advice to clients on how to take their, their businesses and digitally transform them and align them to their clients' new customer experiences. So if you're a retailer, or if you're a bank, or if you're a telco, you have customers. And how do you provide those new solutions to the customers? And how do you take technology and you align that to the customers? The services we provide, you can see, are digital customer experiences around data analytics, cybersecurity, people and change. I don't know how many of you believe that you know, if, uh, if you have to go through a new technology uh, adoption in the, business, uh, in the business that it's easy, you really do need to drive a full change management and a people and change and a culture uh, aspect before you, you're able to actually successfully deploy technology. Making a difference, we spend over 500,000 hours uh, globally. Uh, the, the, the stat I love the most, and I can see this room is, is not aligned to the stat, which is globally out of our 200,000 people, we have 47% females that work at KPMG. So that's a huge, huge difference uh, than this room or the networking industry because having that differentiation really helps us innovate a lot faster to have diversity of thought. Um, but then also, you know, the top six cloud providers, the telecom providers we partner with because if the OEMs are not coming on the open source bandwagon, guess what? The system integrators and consulting firms are right there with you and helping drive that transformation. And you're seeing many of the system integrators and you're seeing many of the consulting firms now come in and work with the clients. Uh, I think yesterday, the founder of, uh, you know, I think ONF was uh, highlighting that there's still a challenge with the big OEMs, not the big OEM networking companies adopting open networking solutions. And, uh, and that's why system integrators are more important. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, if you look at the age, we all talk about you know, the second industrial revolution or third industrial revolution. I like to talk about the age of customer experience. So bear with me for a bit because I think it's important for all of you networking professionals who are working on disrupting the norms of the networking industry and moving towards and, you know, Linux-based or open source-based solutions. I think it's important for you to understand in 2019 that majority of the clients that you know, I advise, the C-suite, the CEOs, the chief digital officers, the chief supply chain officers, uh, even the chairman of the board, the number one challenge that they're grappling with right now is well, how am I going to serve my own customers? Because my own customers is changing. That's the millennial set, it's the Gen Z set. You know, people who come from India and China to Canada and the U.S. feel that they have now come to the third world country. If, you, if, if, they, if they have payment modernization, if you look at that, it's, it used to be a totally different world. And that customer experience is going to change 
you know, the way my 19-year-old son is going to, you know, buy insurance. If, uh, does he really know what the traditional insurance companies uh, look like versus what Amazon, and by the way, Amazon recently just filed to become an insurance company in UK. So when that happens, it's the customer experience that our clients are looking for. So think about this for a second. What is the network's role to provide customer experiences? Should network still be relegated down to the back office and an IT function under a CTO, under a CIO? Or can network be that common denominator that actually connects to the customer experiences? So, so I think I, you're all brilliant individuals and minds. I, I think you understand the slide, so I don't necessarily need to drain it. But the key point is we are not in just a age of information or age of data, we're actually in the age of customer experiences. And these age of customer experiences are driven by you know, multiple factors, uh, just quick bubbles, right? How many billions of 2.5 billion millennials in the world? And you know, how many people coming out of middle class in India and China? And when you look at, when you look at the consumers of, of the products that our clients develop, doesn't matter if you're a cloud company, doesn't matter if you're a telecom, doesn't matter if you're a retailer, doesn't matter if you're an oil and energy uh, company, you are moving in this direction because of these factors. And you also are moving into this factor because, you know, as human beings, because of, you know, social and apps and everything as a service, we delete apps. How many of you have downloaded an app and deleted it uh, after using it for the first time? Come on, this has to be higher than that. <laughs> so it's 75% of the room, right? So now think about if your business becomes an app, which it is becoming, if you're an insurance company or if you're a financial company, you know, uh, how, how many times you actually go into your retail bank versus having it on your phone. Now, if a millennial or a Gen Z or, or, or even somebody who is sandwiched between a baby boomer and a millennial, that's me, I, I don't think anyone will ever remember this generation that I, that I'm, <laughs> that I represent, is, um, is, is, is deleting businesses, and that's why S&P 500 is changing it used to, S&P 500, the companies that were listed on S&P 500 used to last almost 60 years back 50 years ago. Now an average S&P 500 company lasts for 11 to 12 years as an S&P 500 company because someone comes in and disrupts them. And those are major reasons that they get disrupted because you know, you're, you're spending money in a different way. People and clients are consuming different ways. So why, how does all of this connect to the network if you look at the disruption from the top, how many of the CEOs, 38% of the CEOs, say that they need to reposition their business? What that means in English is that they're trying to reposition their business to move in this direction of providing new experiences to their clients or to their customers. Uh, you can see uh, almost the third of the CEOs are, aren't personally ready to lead the radical changes, so they're hiring KPMGs and other consulting firms to help them transition. Guess who Microsoft Azure spends the most time with these days? Guess who GCP or AliCloud or others, they're spending more and more time with consulting firms because we're going in and helping drive a supply chain automation. And if we drive a supply chain automation and the result is that it should be in the Azure cloud or it should be going through this telco, and I'll use an example for you, that is where it's no longer your three-tier channel models. It's directly going down to the business C-suite and getting them to understand that their business and how their business should connect through an SD-WAN from an open MPLS that's now up in the cloud and then connecting it to an Azure or GCP or AWS or you know, Ali Clouds and going through telcos and operators in the middle and what's their value for that. So that is really, if I had to just have you take a picture of one slide or remember one slide, this would be it. And this is a slide that me coming from the networking industry, I had to personally understand and grasp. And that is that at the CEO level, at the board level, they think of front, middle, and back office. They don't think about you know, our layer two, layer three, layer four, all the way up to the OSI layers of layer sevens. They don't think about that. I know you're shocked. They don't think about that. They think about the front office, and the front office functions, as they think about this, is really around their sales teams, their marketing teams, their retail operations, or their customer experiences. Their middle office, they think about their chief supply chain officers, and they think about their you know, operations of making, processing, and delivering around supply chain and procurement. 
then they have a back office function. Now let's relate to everything that you and I and we all understand. And I put these logos there because these logos have one thing in common. Everything that they deploy for these business functions is all in the cloud, right? So if you start with the front office, what does the sales teams all want? Oh, salesforce.com or Microsoft Dynamics or they're providing new CX UX design using Adobe. All of these functions used to reside on a data center as an application that you needed a network to connect. It's now all in the cloud. And they're spending billions of dollars hiring consulting firms to deploy this, right? Then you look at the middle office. Middle office used to be deployed on a traditional JD Edwards or traditional PeopleSoft pla platforms or even SAP and Oracles. That's now moving to ServiceNow or now Anaplan just went public, right? So ServiceNow and Anaplan, all in the cloud. Right? It's, it's like the salesforce.com versions of those. And then you go to the back office, and what's happening in the back office is traditional applications of your file, print, email, and other non-enterprise ERP applications are also being moved to the cloud by loads. So if I showed you all of these logos and said, if these are all of those logos of companies that these business units really care about, you know, they don't really care about the traditional OEMs that we would think of. And, and, and the traditional OEMs, be it Juniper, be it Cisco, or Dell Networking, or HP Networking, and others, they are residing underneath that infrastructure, and they have to somehow connect to these applications and up, move up to the C-suite. So in order to move up to the C-suite, what is the role of the C-suite? And personally, coming from, again, the networking industry, I had to personally unlearn some behaviors myself <laughs> as a human being and learn some new skill sets to understand what is it that the CEO wants from the network rather than just cutting a, cutting a OPEX and a CAPEX check to the CIO or the CTO and what's that connection point. And I think the, you know, my colleague from AT&T and Ericsson talked about this with, with the video that they showed, but, but it's hard for us to connect the dots from the role of the CEO to the chief finance officer to the chief marketing officer and others. And I spend a lot of time with the C-suite. And when I ask them and I tell them, oh, I, you know, I come from the networking industry, they usually ask, what are you doing here? Uh, you, know, you come from the networking industry and how does the, network, how does the network relate to this? And, and I think it's important for them to understand the network plays a very, very, very critical role, and especially an open network that is able to work across all of these applications is an important aspect of it. So I wanted to show you this because you can read these all yourself in terms of what does the chief digital officer care about? What does the CIO or the chief technology officer care about? What does the chief supply chain officer or the chief operating officer from an operations perspective care about? Those things as you're developing your new products in an open source environment, I would say think about that more and more because that is the relevancy you need to create and not just the traditional ways of you know, providing a network infrastructure because client deployed more and more data center. I just came from a very large uh, CEO of, uh, of the largest uh, uh, automotive uh, rental company, and they've just made the decision to move every workload and every application to the cloud. And he said, why would I still need to buy networking um, you know, to, to deploy on-premise? And re reality was that they hadn't thought through the, the rise of edge computing and IoT sensors, and what are those going to be in their new, work, in their new world order, not just the traditional applications that sit on the data center. So, so I think we all know, and I think everybody has geeked out on all of these points uh, around NFV to containers to you know, internet versus <coughs> MPLS uh, to mobility and automation. And all of these have significant impacts, uh, and they drive increased complexity to manage uh, and operate in an ever-changing environment. I think you all understand that, because more and more of these come on, uh, they, they simplify that, and if you are you know, AWS or GCP or you know, Ali Cloud or you know, any of the six big public cloud vendors, your pitch is that this all gets simplified if you move your workloads to the cloud. And I think the key here is really that the world is not as simple. The world comes in three different flavors, right? So the first flavor of the client you go see is, you know, I'm a private cloud, I have my, still my data centers and a bunch of people who are hugging compute and storage and networking technologies, and, and they either burst out to the public cloud or they have applications, and, and then they have their internet access. So that's client number one. It's that, I'm, I'm seeing that personally change more and more. 
The second one is, you know, we have made the decision, like that automotive car company that I just told you about, that everything is going to the cloud, and we're not going to have an on-premise data center, so why are you even talking to me about networking or open networking? Why do I need that? Uh, I can go to my telco, and the telco can abstract MPLS and put it in the cloud, and they can start working towards even other protocols of routing and switching, because, you know, the bandwidth that you're getting from AWS is much, much larger than that. So that's that point. And then there is this reality, which the clients would go to public and then come back and bring their workloads to on-premise because they know that not all workloads work, uh, work well in public, that there is this world of SaaS, there is this world of public, and there's this world of on-premise data center in a containerized as-a-service environments, IaaS, the world of internet, and finally, the word world that is going to be even bigger than, than traditional cloud, which is the rise of edge computing, and, and how does IoT sensors play a role? And the clients who are maturing, and the clients that we advise at KPMG, is really about this entire right hand of this slide, right? Which is how do you look at your traditional applications, not by workloads, by the C-suite applications that I showed you for front, middle, and back office, and how do you connect your cloud solutions to that, right? So you're going all in cloud is one thing, but then having a multi-tier environment on how you abstract different protocols and layers for specific applications. And if an OEM, which is your traditional network provider who's still coming in and seeing every nail is a switch hammer or a routing hammer, or every nail is a white box with this, you know, uh, uh, with, with a Linux-based solution on it, that's not the answer. The answer is really what is the application and then work it down and say how can network play an active and important role. So, you know, that's where we advise a lot of clients that saying, hey, you know, it's not just open networking and it's not just traditional networking. It's really these self-driving networks. So when you have, uh, I just came from an oil and gas uh, uh, client as well. Uh, up in Calgary in Canada, and you know they have the second largest uh, uh, you know oil outside of Saudi Arabia, and and uh, and what they're driving towards is really uh, you know they have wells everywhere, and think about these wells that they have you know uh, human beings driving to the wells and taking the bit out and checking the bit to see if that bit is still functioning or not. Where they're moving towards is putting sensors on those bits, and they're you know connecting. Uh, you know, mash uh, networks with LTE using telcos, which, which is what my AT&T colleague talked about, they're moving towards that direction. And they're moving that towards that direction so that 75% of the roles of those, you know, human beings who actually drive to those wells to check won't be needed because you will move into a proactive environment. You won't be in a reactive environment. And the role of a self-driving network becomes, with all of those sensors, Intelligent, so it's intelligence driven to make predictions, decisions automatically, so you don't need a network guy or a gal who's going out and, and operating that for you. It's analytics driven so that you can actually say this is the you know, ideal uh, percentage, and Ericsson has a great demo that I was looking at uh, last night where they actually show you this machine learning as an actual demo of a network being config configured. And, and actually highlight that for you. And then you look at purpose-driven, which is networks that's aligned to business purpose. And then finally, you know, it's, it's also thinking through you know, the security aspects. Now, you go and have that conversation and connect it to that oil and gas or the well or, or, or an insurance company value proposition. Now you've got the attention of the C-suite because you're no longer talking about the back office CIO, traditional CTO function, you're actually up-leveling it and you're connecting it. So the practice that at KPMG we talk about a lot with our CIOs and CTOs is, a, is that how to connect the value proposition of you not just lowering your CapEx and OpEx, but actually connecting it to the business function and, and helping you understand that. So a self-driving network is really, you know, it's in these four phases that we consult with a lot of those CEOs and we say, you know, telcos and cloud are optionally graded, uh, greater at customer service and flexibility, and you use telco and cloud as optionality. That's the difference. Hybrid cloud IT environments that is automated, fully integrated security architectures, and OPEX and CAPEX, right? So, of course, we, we know all of those discussions. But if I use this, the last two slides to, to wrap up my, my talk, is I'll use an example of a very large insurance company. Their problem 
and I'll, I'll tell you how that connects to the network. Their problem started with they had a current network state and they had a cloud-ready environments and others, but their problem was in their middle office with actuarial data. I don't know how many of you know about actuarial data or worked with actuarial sciences. <laughs> I, I don't think this room would have or I would have, but think about people who actually work on that and at the, at the month end, they had fragmented data between the US, Canada, uh, Asia, and Europe, and they couldn't fragment that data, and they had to spin uh, some servers uh, at an IBM data center that they had outsourced, about you know, six, 700 of them, and they would only use it for five or six days at the end of the year, at the end of the month, but they won't really connect it to, uh, uh, you know, to their actuarial data. They just said the CIO or the CTO will handle that. First, they had to take the fragmentation of that actuarial sciences and understand exactly what that data insight was. And then they had to make a decision to use a telco to say, am I able to take that data using an MPLS that's, that's now in the cloud along with some others that are confidential that went to the cloud? And then they connected it to Microsoft Azure. And that became the number one spinning workload in Microsoft Azure. And it started with actuarial data. It did not. It did not start with, here is Microsoft Azure's value proposition, or here is the telecom provider's value proposition for MPLS. It started with actuarial data. So you know, having the fragmentation solved at different layers is, is key. And I'll end with this, and I'll say, in order for you to think about this with your clients, or even as you are thinking about developing your offers and open networking offers, think about the, the, the four journeys. The one, number one is understand the network's role in the industry specific to digital transformation or digital disruption, right? So what's that role? Point number one. Point number two is creating a strategy where customer experiences are central. I started up with, it's all about the customer experiences. I gave you some examples of an insurance company or a telecom company or, or an oil and gas company. Number three is enterprise-wide strategy that connects the front, middle, back office. The last time I checked, network is the connector of a front, middle, and back office, but it doesn't get positioned that way. And then finally, a culture change of programs through digital transformation. That culture change is the most important thing that is impeding growth, and, uh, and those, those are the key, key stakeholders on driving digital transformation. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, and have a great conference. Take care.